So this chapter of the book covers drug delivery systems, as in the biomaterials that dictate the release and delivery of drugs when given to a patient. Classic examples that we see very often in literature are microparticles, nanoparticles, hydrogel drug delivery systems. Um, commercial applications that have been on the market for years include um, time release doses, 12 hour, 24 hour doses of common over the counter drugs, cold medicines, nicotine patches, um, birth control uh, implants. Um, a lot of classic examples of these. The primary goal in drug delivery is to effectively treat the patient, meaning uh, bring the drug to the patient in the most effective way possible to treat their particular disease, symptom, or sickness. A secondary objective is to efficiently treat that patient, meaning to make the most use of the available drug that's dosed to that patient. Um, I say a secondary objective because inefficiencies are very often considered acceptable, particularly if there are no suitable alternatives. Um, the classic example shown here on this slide is for eye drops or ocular uh, therapeutics because it's very well understood that the eye is not going to absorb anywhere close to 100% of the drug. Uh, and a lot of it leaks out, a lot of it isn't even applied correctly, yet it's such um, a non-invasive way of delivering drugs that it's very commonly um, used. Um, inhalation therapies suffer from inefficient treatments, um, a lot of oral dosage, um, particularly of complex therapeutics like um, proteins, um, suffer from this same fate. Um, and it's really what necessitates the injection, a non, a, a, a considered a highly invasive form of delivering drugs, um, whenever, especially when, when drugs are considered expensive um, and inefficiencies are not acceptable. Since drug delivery formulations are very much time dependent, it's important to go over some pharmacokinetic principles. Um, these deal with both the delivery um, and absorption of the drug, but then also how the body um, metabolizes the drug, excretes it, and gets rid of it from the body. Um, the term pharmacokinetic implies strictly to the pathway and time length of the drug within the body. Another commonly used word, um, especially these type of tests that are done in conjunction with pharmacokinetic studies, are pharmacodynamic studies, which is the study of the effect of a drug with respect to time. So, for instance, the delivery of insulin and the concentration of insulin at the site of delivery in the bloodstream, its metabolites, and then its um, excretion from the liver uh, would be examples of a pharmacokinetic study, whereas the levels of blood glucose levels in response to the insulin would be an example of the pharmacodynamic measurement parameters. So a few of the stages of the drug kinetics are displayed here on the right and then conveniently abbreviated in this LEDME um, acronym. All right, so the first step is the liberation of the drug from the formulation, the actual release, typically at the concentrated site, whether it's an IV injection um, or at the you know, route of delivery, the site of delivery. So that's where it would start off at its highest concentration and then as it gets distributed throughout the body, that would lower in concentration, which brings us to the absorption of the drug into the blood. Um, from that, you have the distribution of the drug to the various different body parts and organs, and a lot of drugs preferentially accumulate in different parts of the body. So a lot, large part of pharmacokinetic studies are to take samplings of not just the blood, but to uh, take tissue samples, organ samples in a non-survival study um, or an endpoint study. Um, and then from there, as the drug gets distributed throughout the body, the body starts to metabolize, usually through the liver. So that's where you would see a decrease of the amount of drug in the body as a total mass perspective um, and an increase in the amount of metabolites. So that would increase in time as the amount of drug in the body decreases um, 
Another method for the drug to decrease in the body is actually through its elimination, typically through urine. Um, sweat is another common example. Um, but that's where this excreted drug part of the graph comes in. There are a few math principles I like to go over that cover the, the general absorption or release kinetics of a drug from a drug delivery device, um, but also including its metabolism or elimination from the body. Uh, they all tend to follow this general sort of rate equation, which is the change in concentration of a drug with respect to time is equal to uh, some sort of constant K uh, times the concentration of that drug to some sort of order. Okay, so whenever we say zero order or first order, second order, that implies the number that's attached to that N superscript, that exponential term. And the plus minus is there is just to show that um, an absorption into the body, as in gaining the amount of drug, would be a positive value. If you want to model the drug release from the actual drug delivery system, it would be a negative term because the drug is being liberated and is leaving the drug delivery vehicle. So it's really dependent on your point of perspective, whether it's plus or minus. Now, zero order is a term we're going to hear a lot, so that's where the n number is equal to zero, which very conveniently just reduces down to uh, a mathematical constant. So the change of concentration with respect to time is constant. Okay, that's what a zero order implies. And it's very convenient to have a drug delivery system that's zero order um, because it's so predictable. It's not changing with respect to time. It's just constant. So this is the gold standard, what people always go for. And it's very often difficult to achieve this. If you were to integrate this rate profile, it's very simple. You integrate the concentration term on the left, the time component on the right, and you simply get the concentration with respect to time is either plus or minus times the rate constant times time, and then plus your starting concentration at that point. Very often zero for a simplified uh, math equation. Um, and there are many other uh, examples here. I've also put first order here. You can imagine second order would have n equals 2. Third order would be n equals 3. First order and second order are very commonly seen alternatives to zero order. Um, and this is typically what you see in elimination terms from the body, um, diffusion terms uh, of drug release, uh, leaving drug delivery systems. So in this case, n is equal to 1. So you have the change in the concentration with respect to time is equal to K times that concentration. So it's with respect to the concentration. If you have a high starting concentration, the change is going to be a lot higher than towards the end of your release profile where you have little concentration left and it starts trickling down to a very slow release rate. So this one, when you integrate it, gets a little bit more complicated because if you were to take that A term on the right, bring it into the denominator of the left and bring the time back over to the right. Um, you would need a logarithmic term to integrate this. So uh, then you're left with this Arrhenius equation, it's called. Um, the um, concentration profile is equal to some constant, which is really just the um, natural log of the starting concentration, times the exponential term of either plus or minus the rate constant times time. So this is an exponential one whereas a zero order is a linear one. All right, a very common example of a zero order release profile that we hear about all the time, uh, in this case, and sorry, it's not release, but the elimination would be a zero order, right, of uh, um, alcohol from your body, okay? So the rate of which alcohol leaves the body is constant no matter how many drinks you have. Um, so the very common rule of thumb is that, you know, if you're trying to figure out when, when you can drive safely, you just back calculate how many drinks have you had, and it's one drink per hour is the common rule of thumb of the elimination rate of alcohol from the body. Um, and it's really because the liver uh, can only metabolize uh, a small amount of alcohol at a time, so it very easily gets saturated, um, and that's why more alcohol can't be um, metabolized even though you have higher concentrations in the body. Most drug metabolism processes uh, follow first order. Now, when considering the drug release profile within the body, and we talk about 
um, the drug absorption into the body and then the metabolism of it and the release of it from the drug delivery vehicle. Um, there are a lot of challenges that are presented to um, engineers as they try and come up with the most ideal drug delivery vehicle. Okay, and two things that they really need to consider is first the therapeutic threshold, as in what's the minimum concentration of the drug in the body that's necessary to have a therapeutic effect, right, to, to show efficacy, okay? A threshold above that would be the toxicity threshold, okay, which is the concentration in the body where the patient starts sowing adverse side effects. Um, and in between that, you kind of have what, what's called the therapeutic window, okay? You want your drug concentration to be above the therapeutic threshold, below the toxicity threshold, okay? If you were to have... Um, a double dose of your drug, you'll be within the toxicity threshold, and then you're dependent on your drug, meta your, your body metabolizing that drug in order to get back down to safe uh, levels, okay? Now, a drug delivery vehicle that has a 48-hour dose, sometimes we talk about release in terms of weeks even in literature, um, uh, is that you have a lot of drug packed into this drug depot within the body with potential uh, serious side effects. And you need to be very sure that the release um, is very predictable so that the drug concentrations remain below the toxicity threshold, even though you theoretically have more than ample amount of drug to produce side effects in your body. It's just they're contained in the drug delivery vehicle. Um, this is especially complicated for... Um, multi-dose regimens. Um, there are many drugs on the market that you need to build up uh, levels within the body over the course of maybe a few weeks even to have therapeutic effects, um, in part because they get metabolized so slowly and it's important that you not take a very large dose at one time where it can all be, um, you know, potentially inducing damaging side effects within the body. A very important ratio that we talk about uh, in this area is the therapeutic index, which is the ratio of those two thresholds, the toxicity threshold to the therapeutic threshold. Um, the larger this therapeutic index, the larger of a window that you have to play around with, where you can have safe and effective concentrations in the body uh, and still be below that toxicity threshold. If you have a really narrow window, then you'd have a relatively low therapeutic index, uh, dangerously close to one, um, which means you have very little room to play with. Your drug delivery system um, needs to have a very absolutely predictable um, output in this case uh, in order to not cause harm to the patient. This brings up the important issue of patient compliance in drug delivery systems. It's really one of the greatest challenges to engineers when marketing and developing drug delivery products is having to rely on patients to take drugs in a very predictable and systematic manner, okay? And a lot of times, it's not well established um, or it's not well followed what the patients will do with a particular drug delivery system. And it could be due to a number of different reasons, uh, which we call kind of health literacy, which is misunderstanding of the side effects or consequences of a drug, uh, the medicinal cost, uh, plain forgetfulness, incompetency, lack of trucks within the dro in the doctors. Um, these type of issues um, are exasperated in drugs that have very low therapeutic windows. Okay, where it's very strictly regimented that a patient take a drug at the exact 24-hour cycle, you know, in the evening as opposed to the morning. Patients can sometimes forget their medication in the evening, think, well, I'll just take a double dose the next morning to make up for it. As these type of problems, I lead them back into the toxicity or past the toxicity threshold and outside of the therapeutic window. Um, so it absolutely needs to be considered how patients might not comply with a drug regimen in engineering drug delivery vehicles. So when we go back to the drug level versus time for multi-dose regimens, we see a couple examples here um, of, for instance, like a bolus measurement where a drug might, or a patient might take a drug at specific timed intervals where that drug is delivered and available instantaneously to the body. 
So we see here very repeatable curves of that drug going into the toxicity threshold, getting metabolized, readministration of that drug. And you can kind of imagine scenarios where these waveforms might be stacked upon each other where patients take a drug um, at shorter intervals than what's required. Or if they take it at much later intervals than what's required, say if they skip a regimen, um, then it might not even reach the therapeutic window. Or let's say if they try and um, catch back up to their medication cycle and they take a double dose, then they're far exceeding the toxicity threshold. So there are a lot of different circumstances where patient compliance can result in adverse side effects uh, that were not on the particular label of that drug, so if the patient was going off-label with it. And then here's where we see the power of a zero-order release profile, where a patient takes it, and because the release of the drug from a zero-order um, drug delivery system matches that of the um, excretion and metabolism of that drug within the body, we get this nice sustained plateau concentration of the drug within the body, which is often why um, zero-order release profiles are the gold standard for drug delivery systems. So those multiple or different pharmacokinetic profiles brings in the concept of um, something I've alluded to throughout the entire presentation so far is controlled drug delivery systems, um, which is a field that got its start in the 60s with polymer and silicone-based drug delivery systems. Um, the book seems to define controlled de drug delivery systems, specifically as zero-order release profile um, release systems. Uh, that's not a defined term, and oftentimes in literature, I see it just as anything that has predictable release. So that's something that I'm, I'm calling it here. Zero-order or first-order release profiles are certainly examples of controlled drug delivery systems. Um, it's important to know that not all disease models necessitate zero order, despite it being um, what I called earlier as the gold standard. Um, there can absolutely be advantages to first order in that they can release the necessary amount of drugs to get you into that therapeutic window fast, um, second order release systems as well, and then slowing down to give a more predictable, or sorry, not predictable, but uh, a little bit more constant um, and less exponentially evolving profile. Um, here in the table uh, on the right in A1, it kind of gives examples according to size scale. So macro scale ones that we can actually hold in our hands. Examples would be implants, inserts, patches, um, osmotic pumps. Um, and then we kind of get into the macro scale one. These could be oral tablets that are made up of microparticles or de degradable microparticles that we inject into ourselves. Um, and now, of course, a hot topic in the past decade or so has been anything on the nano scale, right? And you say nano, that's a hot word these days. Um, so pegylated drug delivery systems, my cells, uh, PLGA nanoparticles like we like the students talked about in their presentations. Um, and then also targeted antibody, ligand, membrane, receptor system um, drugs that are all count as controlled drug, drug delivery systems. Targeted drug delivery systems um, are really a hot topic and have been for the past 10, 20 years. Um, the idea here is to improve the specificity of a particular treatment. You want to hone in that particular drug so that it acts exactly on the site that you want. Okay, A term that we use a lot in literature and in our field um, is a sort of uh, a silver bullet effect of a drug, where you might have a drug, a classic example is a chemotherapeutic drug that is actually toxic to all cells, but if you can take it in a non-specific manner, like an oral dosage form, a very convenient form for patients to take, and have it be absorbed by the body and hone in to the exact site or target, like a tumor, and have it act only on tumor cells or cancerous cells, then you kind of have your magic bullet effect. Um, there's a couple different ways that we can target these things, and they fall in two different categories. One being passive, which makes use of the physiochemical characteristics of the target drug or tissues even. Um, it could be size, 
uh, charge, hydrophobicity. I mean, these are all things that attracted to a particular site and not others. Um, a classic example is in tumors, they have this effect known as the enhanced permeability and retention effect, EPR, where they're a little bit more porous and a little bit more leaky than other tissues. So if you have particles of a particular size, I think um, it's you know, less than a micron and above 100 nanometers, these particles tend to just accumulate in, tu in tumors when they wouldn't accumulate in other areas. So you could have these particles with toxic chemotherapy drugs loaded into them, ones that might be well above the toxic threshold of healthy cells, but be because they accumulate in tumors, they have this sort of passively targeted system. Okay, a little bit more cooler method is this active targeting system, which makes use of specific molecular patterns, receptors, antibodies, um, that can hone in on these molecular targets on particular cells. So there's a couple of different ones listed here on the left-hand side here. So immunotargeting, we have antibodies, antibodies frag fragments. Um, again, going back to our previous lecture on the humoral immunity effects, um, antibodies are highly specific, so if you engineer a drug delivery system that are specific to very exact types of cells or molecular patterns and type of cells, they're, they're very effective. Um, cells also have carbohydrate ligands on them, lectin, mannose, galactose, uh, that you can hone in on. Um, Nutrient-based ones, so cells need transferrin, they need folic acid, so they have these receptors for them. Um, so if you attach a drug to transferrin, to lectin uh, as a carbohydrate, uh, the cells will naturally take them up. And it won't just act at the site, but the cells will actually take them within the cell so they can act on an intracellular basis as opposed to extracellular. The book covers a number of different types of drug delivery systems, and I've selected uh, three or four to go over that I think uh, are not only more common but also particularly interesting. Uh, the first one being polymeric micelles. Okay, micelles are made up of self-assembling block copolymers um, that rearrange themselves in very specific patterns in aqueous media. Um, these block copolymers typically have a hydrophilic side and a hydrophobic side. Um, a lot of times, you know, any surfactant is uh, you know, would make up micelles in a system so that. They arrange themselves where their hydrophilic tails or heads, depending on their orientation, um, face the water side, and then their hydrophobic ends congregate together away from the water um, in a thermodynamically stable fashion, um, such as the shapes here that you see on the right. Uh, they're typically small, anywhere from 10 to 100 nanometers. Um, they have a couple different ways of forming. They could either form through phospholipid micelles, and we'll get into phospholipid bilayers and liposomes in uh, a, a subsequent slide. Um, pleuronic micelles are thermally responsive. Um, there's different types of poly L amino acids. So you can have block copolymers of PEG uh, and PLA to form these polymeric micelles, and then also polyester micelles. In literature, I see micelles used very often for tumor targeting applications. Um, one thing to know about micelles is that they're only stable above a concentration known as the critical micelle concentration. Um, below that particular concentration, which is a function of both the solvent like water and then also the surfactant capabilities of these, uh, of these polymers, um, they really only arrange themselves at the surface. And they're, in fact, called surfactants because they tend to lower the surface tension of uh, solutions. Um, and once the surface gets crowded with these uh, polymers at a particular concentration, it finally forces them into the solution where the only stable way for them to form is in these micelle uh, type of shapes. Okay, so below that concentration... They only act at surfaces of solution. And it's thought that once you inject these um, drug delivery vehicles into the body and they start to distribute themselves and um, effectively dilute themselves as they spread out, 
then they become unstable and release their products all at once as opposed to having a very controlled delivery system while they are stable at higher concentrations. A very similar drug delivery system to my cells are liposomes because they're made up of similar types of materials that have a water soluble a hydrophilic end and then an oil soluble hydrophobic end. Um, the only difference is that this time liposomes tend to form into bilayers where they have their hydrophobic ends meet into a typical layer that then forms a circular shape, whereas my cells are really only a single layer where the oil, the hydrophobic end, forms the entirety of the core. Okay, liposomes have an aqueous core and an aqueous outer layer, uh, whereas inside the bilayer is where you have the hydrophobic end. So there's a couple different ways that these, these can be used with different drugs, right? For hydrophobic drugs, you could have the drug within the bilayer, within that, hydrophob that hydrophobic layer that, that makes up the shell. Um, or if you have hydrophilic drugs, they could be encapsulated in the aqueous core that only diffuse out over a controlled release pattern. Um, so they're a little bit more flexible than my cells because my cells can only entrap typically hydrophobic drugs when you have an aqueous outer layer like you would in the body. Um, size range of liposomes tend to range anywhere from 25 to 100 nanometer. Uh, the multi malleor type of vesicles, where you could have uh, many types of shells in these, can get larger and larger, even into the micron range. So they're highly tunable because of these properties. They can have different types of drugs. They can have many combination of drugs, both hydrophobic and hydrophilic. Uh, hydrophilic. So there are a couple of different advantages that they have over my cells. Another important one being that liposomes are stable uh, at various concentrations, unlike my cells that have that critical my cell concentration, like I alluded to earlier. So, um, you know, of course, our cells in the body are made up of lipid bilayers. Um, so they're very much like liposomes in that case. All right. So a couple of things to consider for liposomes that they tend to need cholesterol in that lipid bilayer in order to keep them from, uh, in order to maintain their stability, okay? So they, they tend to leak um, and get disrupted without cholesterol. Larger liposomes have a problem with being cleared more rapidly by the uh, RES system, what's known as the reticuloendothelial system. This is a term we hear a lot in drug delivery uh, and it's sort of a fancy name for the mononuclear phagocyte clearance system, right? Macrophages. Macrophages recognize these things as being foreign. And larger liposomes have a greater ability to accumulate surface proteins that are recognized by macrophages and get cleared more readily. Uh, a very common way of combating this is to attach uh, polyethylene glycol, PEG, on the outside of these shells. Very common for all types of micelles, nanoparticles, uh, even drugs that can just be conjugated to PEG. Um, because it prevents them being cleared from the RES, right, from the reticular endothelial system, and then gives those drugs uh, larger retention times in the body, allowing them to be more effective and also more efficient because you have to use less drugs. Uh, charged liposomes also clear more rapidly, in part because they have a better ability to bind to um, opsonins, again, something that the RES recognizes. Um, and then also the half-life of particular liposomes increases with dosage, in part because we begin to saturate the ability of the RES system to recognize this, uh, kidney clearances systems, and other excretion mechanisms um, become saturated and thus allow liposomes to have a longer residence in the body. Our next type of drug delivery system are dendromers. All right, so now if we were in class and I was talking to in person, I would say, does anyone know what that means? Does anyone know Greek? Alex would raise his hand. I'd say, Alex, what does it mean? He would say, well, dendros means tree and meros means part. And so it's tree part, which brings us to the concept of having these highly branched structures that kind of look like trees that radiate outwards with their branches, right? So they're made of a, a inner core and then these long um, extruding branches of these polymers that all disperse out 
Um, they can be highly tuned to have a low poly dispersity and high degree of functionality. The drugs in this case would be entangled within all the different branches at different parts of the core. Um, we can make them to range anywhere from one to 10 nanometer uh, particles, uh, in part because these are single molecules of these polymers, right? So 10 meter large size molecules is a rather large polymer. Dendromers tend to have uh, four properties that make them highly tunable and highly advantageous for drug delivery, okay? One would be their water solubility. Um, another would be their monodispersity, meaning that we can tune them to have the same exact size from one another. Um, my cells have this property. Polymeric nanoparticles tend to suffer from this. We tend to get, make a large polydispersity, meaning we have a mix of small size and large size particles within a particular system. Um, we can tune their encapsulation ability, so their ability to retain and load drugs into them. And then also we can attach any types of functionalizable peripheral groups where we can add antibodies or transferrin, folic acid, carbohydrate targeting uh, molecules, um, or even PEG, like I mentioned before, if we want to limit the ability of these denomers to be taken up by the RES, increase their circulation time and their half-life uh, in vivo. Um, so highly tunable. Another application for drug delivery or control delivery systems is the delivery of nucleic acids to cells. Okay, it's an extremely specific and effective treatment for a variety of diseases um, that are based on genetics or uh, intracellular deficiencies. Okay, now in these cases, these nucleic acid-based drugs modulate the protein expression profiles of cells by interfering either with gene transcription or with translation. Um, so oftentimes the expression of a missing protein can, in this case, be restored by introducing the gene itself or, for instance, the messenger RNA transcript back into the desired cell. Okay? And there's two routes that uh, this can be accomplished. One would be through viral delivery, where we use uh, native mechanisms of invasive viruses, but this time tuned to our particular applications of introducing nucleic acids, or through non-viral delivery through uh, polymer-based mechanisms. Now, viral delivery mechanisms make use of a virus's natural ability to efficiently deliver DNA to specific cells. Okay, viral vectors in this case contain a modified genome within the um, virion structure. However, the modified genome contains only the essential viral sequences for the desired transcription unit. Okay, so in this case, all the invasive or other um, you know, viral replicating ap uh, applications of the virus have been removed, so that's no longer a danger to the host. Um, so in this case, it's very efficient at penetrating the cells because viruses themselves have evolved to be very efficient. Um, but of course, uh, a big disadvantage is that viruses are recognized by the host immune system and thereby have a very short half-life and are taken out quickly um, by both the innate and adaptive immune systems. Non-viral delivery mechanisms fall either typically into uh, polymer applications, which are called polyplexes because they contain, contain plasmid DNA within polymers, or liposomes, which are called lipoplexes because they have the plasmid DNA within the liposomes. Their advantages and disadvantages are kind of the exact opposite of the viral delivery mechanisms, okay? One being that they're not as efficient, right? These mechanisms, of course, have not evolved uh, any penetrating or cell delivery mechanisms the same way viruses have. Uh, but, of course, they're less immunogenic, meaning that the immune system isn't going to attack these as often. So if efficiency is not a concern, then you can typically rely on these non viral delivery mechanisms. The last drug delivery mechanism that we're going to talk about is transdermal delivery, perhaps not as exciting as some of these uh, targeting magic bullet, uh, silver bullet, sorry, or um, sophisticated mechanisms like we talked about before, but certainly common. 
um, and also very standard in industry. Okay. Now, transdermal roots, which relies on applying patches or mechanisms to the skin, can fall into either passive or active transdermal delivery. Okay. Passive systems rely on the drug itself being able to diffuse through the transdermal layer, which means it typically has to be small and lipophilic. Okay. So this allows the drug to get through on its own and enter systemic circulation by itself. Active systems, not to be confused with active targeting and passive targeting like how we talked about before, um, require some sort of mechanical disruption of the stratum corneum, which is the main barrier of skin penetration. A very basic and common example of an active transdermal delivery system would be microneedles that simply penetrate themselves past the stratus corneum, um, thus allowing the drugs to be released at the needle point and into and enter systemic circulation. Um, there's also ways of uh, disrupting that layer through electromagnetic energy um, in order to allow drugs to pass through as well. Um, at this point, just check out the link to this YouTube video I would have shown in class, but you can just enter it on your own and then take it from there and then we'll pick it up into uh, degradation mechanisms and materials, how those can factor into drug release, um, but then also potential uh, toxicity in the next lecture. Thanks.